So in this module, in this unit, we'll introduce the basics of exploratory data analysis. So what is exploratory data analysis? So exploratory data analysis was begun by this person, John Tukey, and uh, he was a professor in Princeton University, and he laid down the basic principles of exploratory data analysis. You could consider him as the father of exploratory data analysis. Incidentally, uh, Tukey is also famous for having invented the box plot, which is a commonly used plot in data analysis in general, and the fast Fourier transform, which is not related to uh, general statistics, but it's a very important finding. Uh, he was also the person who coined the term bit for binary digit. Okay, that is something that's not very well known, but John Tukey was pretty much a pioneer in his time. Okay, so what is exploratory data analysis? Now, typically when we embark on data analysis, we get data in, you know, large data sets. And if you just looked at the data set, it would look something like this. You know, just a bunch of numbers, and uh, it's difficult to make too much sense when data is just displayed in raw form, in the form of numbers. With the exploratory data analysis, what we are trying to do is to get uh, the data into a form in which it makes more sense to us. Okay, so it makes it more easy for our minds to see what is in the data. Okay, so that's the real idea of exploratory data analysis. So some statements by Tukey on exploratory data analysis. So the idea of exploratory data analysis is obviously to explore a data set or a bunch of data sets look beneath appearances for new insights. Okay, so we are really searching for new insights when we look at this. And another simple thing is anything that makes a simpler description possible makes the description more easily handleable. Right, so obviously uh, basic raw data sets are very complex things within which we cannot see patterns easily. And the idea of exploratory data analysis is to find it uh, find simpler ways of representing the data. Okay, so that makes the description more easily handleable than the original complex data set. Another important uh, saying by Tukey is, to say that we have looked one level deeper is a definite step forward, though not as far as to say that we have looked one level deeper and found such and such. Okay, so which is that in exploratory data analysis, we just don't want to look, but we want to draw some conclusions from what we have looked, at least tentative conclusions. The greatest value of a picture is when it forces us to see what we never expected to see. Okay, this is a very key insight that we want to see things, we want our analysis to reveal things that are not very obvious. Okay, Tukey also coined the term confirmatory data analysis. Now I want to point out in the context of confirmatory data analysis that this slide is really talking from the point of view of traditional statistics, right? So in traditional statistics, obviously we have talk about populations and samples, then we talk about making some findings on the sample, making some calculations or computations on the sample, and then enlarging that conclusion to the population, which is called inference, okay? That is, we are inferring from the sample some things about the population. And of course, when we do that, we can never be certain that what we are saying based on the sample really applies to the population. So we have to calculate a certain level of confidence which uh, we can ascribe to it, meaning how confident are we that our analysis is correct. Okay, so this is what is confirmatory data analysis and uh, it plays a very important role in traditional statistics. But we have to remember that, in tra that traditional statistics evolved in times when gathering data and processing data was very costly, right? You could not gather uh, all of traditional statistics developed between, let's say, the late 1800s and the mid 1900s. Okay, that's the core of the discipline was laid down at that time. And during those periods, it wasn't very easily possible for us to collect a large amount of data. It's just people had to manually collect the data. So that was a costly process. And then analyzing the data had to be done by hand which is also a costly process and it's got serious limitations as to how much of data you can analyze. And therefore, the thrust of traditional statistics was to develop 
very intelligent, very smart techniques of making inferences on the population based on the sample and placing a number on how confident we can be about this inference between the sample and the population. That was the thrust of traditional analysis. And this is what is called confirmatory data analysis. And of course, Tukey was a person who worked uh, up to the 90s, early 90s. Uh, so therefore, uh, a lot of things that have happened subsequently were not accessible at that point in time. And this is where things stood. Okay. But today, when we look at data mining, data analytics, business analytics, today we are not looking at confirmatory data analysis with the same amount of importance. That's mainly because today we can gather large amounts of data very easily. Right? So data sets with millions of rows are not at all uncommon. Hundreds of thousands of rows, very common. And when you perform analysis on these, you're not really concerned about confidence and so on for the most part because you're working with a large amount of data. And even more importantly, I think you have to understand the fact that we are not looking at doing things that are very, very likely correct. You know, that we have a 95% confidence in what we are trying to say, right? That is because businesses are always looking at incremental benefits, right? That is, without the analysis, what are we able to do today? With the analysis, what additional benefits are we getting, right? So things like a 10% decrease in cost or a 10% increase in sales or a 15% reduction in uh, wastage, all of these are extremely significant benefits for a business, right? And for example, suppose you take uh, a model that somebody is building to determine whether a customer will default on a payment or not, okay? Now you may build a model that is not at all accurate. You may build a model that has an accuracy level of only 60%, meaning it's wrong 40% of the time. However, it may still be a useful model if without the model, we could do only 50%. Okay, or without the model, we could do only 40%, right? Then the additional benefit you're getting for a large organization in terms of monetary value, it can still be very large, okay? So when we're looking at data analytics, when we're looking at uh, business analytics, our goals are very different from what traditional statistics would have. So in business analytics, we build predictive models. And as long as the predictive model is useful in a practical sense, provides a slight bit of increase in performance for the organization, that's good enough, okay? So we don't want to harp on too much about confirmatory data analysis, okay? Of course, this is a statement that Tukey made, which is uh, from the point of view of the earlier times, saying we can no longer get along without confirmatory analysis. In other words, statistics during his time had to establish the confidence of inferences that they were making. He's saying we can't get along without it, but we definitely need not start with it, right? That means that he's saying that the starting point is exploratory data analysis. That's very important to understand. Okay, so some key insights from Tukey are, graphs are for qualitative, descriptive, conceivably the semi-quantitative, but never for the carefully quantitative, right? That is, you cannot draw hard and fast quantitative inferences from graphs. They give you ideas for what you can further explore numerically. And graphs are for comparison. And graphs are for impact, right? That is, we found something when we did the analysis. We want to convince others it is true. Nothing is better than a visual way of convincing people. Edward Tufte is another person who is very influential when it comes to uh, data visualization, visual presentation of information, and so on. He's written a number of books, uh, and Edward Tufte is still active in publishing and so on. Some of his ideas have become very uh, widespread and accepted. So focus on content, not the visualization technique. Okay, that is, uh, let's not de determine the visualization we are going to present based on what techniques are available. So for example, you can look at Excel and say, oh, I can easily create a pie chart. Let me create a pie chart of what we are trying to do. Okay. Now, the kind of chart you choose and the kind of visualization you choose should depend on your purpose. And the visualization techniques that you know or which are easy should not be guiding what we do. Compare, don't just describe. Comparison is very, very important 
In fact, you will see that as we proceed forward, we'll be doing uh, emphasizing quite a bit on comparing various things rather than just presenting information. Show multiple variables. Now, given that we usually present our graphs on a two-dimensional surface, the maximum number of variables we can bring into play is two. That's what it looks like. But we can bring in a lot more variables into play. Of course, we don't want to confuse people by showing too many variables. But when you want to compare, it becomes important to bring in many variables. And we'll be learning techniques of how to do that. Another very important thing to consider when we are doing uh, data visualization, when we are doing exploratory data analysis, after all, when we do data analysis, we are trying to do data analysis most of the time to find out what is causing what, right? That something happened and we want to find out what is the cause of that so that we can take appropriate action. A lot of statistical analysis, a lot of analysis is about what is causing what and therefore exploratory data analysis should try and show possible causality, right? In other words, let's say that sales went down during a certain period. That's not important or it's not useful to simply show, okay, sales went down, right? That, that's okay. That's useful as a piece of information. But of, often what people are, would be interested in is to find out why did it go down? What is it or which set of factors caused the sales to go down? And if your visualization is able to clearly show this, that is good. Of course, again, we only say possible causality because establishing that something caused something else is a complex process. We have to do a far more detailed analysis to establish that it's really true. But showing a hypothesis and saying that this is possible, this is likely, is useful as a starting point. So that's also very important when we try to do exploratory data analysis. With R, we typically use two kinds of graphics. One is called base graphics. And base graphics is the graphic system that comes pre-installed with R. That is, when you install R, you've got base graphics. And it's useful uh, to generate, uh, you know, simple kind of graphs, like histograms and box plots and so on. You want to generate something quickly. Uh, base graphics is very useful. So we'll take a very brief look at base, base graphics. I'm not getting, going to get into too much detail. Today, most of the people use what is called as ggplot. It's an external package that you add on to to R in order to do this. Okay, so uh, ggplot is what you'll be, we'll be using for the most part. So we'll take a very quick look at base graphics. Okay, the main problem with base graphics is that it has evolved over a long period of time and therefore things have become very uh, inconsistent. There is no general consistency with all the things. I mean, base graphics is very powerful. You can do anything you want with base graphics but there's no consistency. ggplot uh, is beautiful in the sense that everything is very consistent. It's easy to generate complex graphs with ggplot. That's the whole idea. Before we look at base graphics, let's just look at other ways of getting textual summaries of data. The most common thing, of course, is the basic data summary. So here, what we are trying to do is to read our file autompg.csv. This is a file that you should have. Uh, and here we are saying header equals true, strings as factor equals false. Now, header equal to true is an optional input that you can give to read.csv. Most of the time we'll just say read.csv and we'll give the file name, nothing else, right? But uh, header equals to true is actually the default, so there's really no need to say this. But what it's telling you is that the CSV file that we are reading has a header row, okay? So if you don't do that, if your file has a header row, and you don't, uh, if you say header equals false, or alternately, if your file doesn't have a header row and you don't say header equals true, then the first row of data will actually be considered as a heading and that will cause problems, okay? So that's why uh, here this is clearly not required. We are saying this just to show that there is such an option. Strings as factors equals false, we are saying, because by default, whenever you've got a character column in your CSV file, read.csv automatically converts that into a factor, okay? If you don't want it to convert that to a factor, you can say strings as factors equals false. The default is strings as factors equals true, okay? In this particular file, I'm using this just to illustrate the idea that there is this kind of option. Uh, in this data file, there also happens to be a column called car name, which is the name of the car, and 
you know, that we're not particularly going to use it for any kind of analysis. And so we're saying just keep it as a character column, don't treat it as a string column. Okay. Another important thing is we've already pointed out that sometimes you have columns which have numeric values, but you want them to be treated as factors because the numeric values are just indicators. They really don't have a numeric uh, uh, meaning and it's just a symbol. So for example, you can code gender as male and female, you know, zero and one, one and zero, whatever you like. Now the one and zero has no significance. It's just to say that they are different, that's all. Okay, so in those cases, the numeric nature of the data is not really important. You want R to simply treat it as a category. So in order to do that, uh, and by default, when a read.csv reads data from a column that contains numeric values, it treats it as a numeric variable. It cannot uh, know that we want it to be a factor, so we are converting it. So here we are saying auto dollar cylinders equals uh, factor auto dollar cylinders, right? So auto dollar cylinders is basically from the auto data frame, we are referring to the column called cylinders. You already know that dollar is what we use to uh, get at columns of a data uh, of a data frame is one of the things we can do to get at columns of a data frame so we are saying auto dollar cylinders is assigned the result of this function factor auto dollar cylinders now we could have ended the function call right here by just saying faction factor auto dollar cylinders uh, but we want to provide addition in that case what will happen is that the current values for cylinders are 3 4 5 6 and 8 Okay, so in that case, the values will still remain as 3, 4, 5, 6, and 8, but R will treat them as factors, right? So what we want to tell R is, well, don't keep them as 3, 4, 5, 6, and 8. Instead, call it as 3 cylinders, 4 cylinders, 5 cylinders, etc. so that when we look at it, it makes a lot more sense to us, right? So while con converting into a factor using the factor function, right, we are also saying levels equals C3, 4, 5, 6, 8. Those are the levels in the data set we have and the labels are these that is for the three cylinder cars call this column as 3cyl uh, call the value as 3cyl not just three as, and so on and so on okay so this is just a common conversion that you might do uh, so for example in this particular data set there are many things like cylinders gears etc which all have numeric values which we will be treating as factors Okay, so you might see four cylinders, you might also see four gears. So when something just, when you plot a chart, for example, and it simply displays four, you don't know whether that four is talking about gears or cylinders. On the other hand, if cylinders, it says three cylinders, in four cylinders instead of just four, that'll make a lot more sense. Okay, so in general, uh, it might be useful to assign labels to factor levels just for display purposes, not for anything else. There's no other meaning it has. In terms of computations, keeping them as numbers is perfectly fine. Okay, so now if you use the summary function to get a summary of a data frame, what you will get is something like this. Okay, so summary auto. I'm showing you only two columns. The data frame I think has nine columns. I'm showing you only two of them. The first column is MPG and MPG is a numeric column. So whenever you have a numeric column, the summary consists of these six numbers, minimum, maximum, first quartile, mean, which is the second quartile, uh, sorry, median, which is the second quartile, and the third quartile, okay? So first quartile is, if you sort the numbers from lowest to highest, what number falls at the 25% level? That's what is the first quartile. Median, of course, is a 50% middle value. Mean is just the average. Third quartile is 75%, maximum is the maximum. Okay, so if a variable is a numeric variable, you see these num uh, results as output. If a variable is a factor, so for example, if you take cylinders, the one that we just converted into a factor in the previous slide, the display looks like this. What it's telling you is that in the data set, there are four cars with three cylinders, 204 cars with four cylinders, three cars with five cylinders, and so on. Okay, so for factors, it is just going to give you a count of how many elements are there, how many rows are there with a particular value. With numbers, with numeric variables, it's going to give you this kind of output, right? So when you look at summary, it'll, and if you take a close look, you'll know what variables are numeric, which are factors, and therefore you'll know whether you need to convert something or not, 
Okay, of course, what is shown above is only the partial output. The actual output will have this kind of summary for nine variables. Another function that is also sometimes useful is this string function, str function. And so if I did str auto, this is what I'm going to see. It's showing us all the columns, okay, that is number, MPG, cylinders, displacement, horsepower, weight, acceleration, model year, and car name. Uh, of course, it's telling us that auto is a data frame, data dot frame, 398 observations, that means 398 rows of nine variables. Okay, that means there are nine columns within that data frame. The first column is called number. It's got all integer values showing that. The second column is called MPG, and it's saying that this is numeric, not integer. Why? Because there's some values are fraction, 15.5, 32.9. It's got fractional values as well as whole number values. So it's treating this column as a numeric column, which means general number, not just an integer. If all the values are pure integers, then it'll treat them as integers. Okay, so cylinder factors, because we converted it to factors with five levels, three cylinder, four cylinder, etc. And then it's showing the actual values, right? The actual values are just shown as two, one, two, two, four, etc. Well, two would be in four cylinder, one would be in three cylinder, four would be in three, four, uh, uh, five, six, eight. So four would be in six, etc. Okay, so that is uh, this thing. So what it does is it basically shows you for every column what kind of data is in the column and some initial values, right? So if you have read the data and you do a str and you look at the uh, result, you'll know if there are any mistakes that have been that have occurred. So for example, sometimes when you have a large Excel data set, CSV file, you know, initially when you look at it, the data in a particular column might all look like numbers. Okay, and in fact, let's say they're supposed to be numbers. But later on, somewhere down the road, some the one particular cell, there might be some non-numeric value sitting out there in the data file. Why? Because of mistakes or whatever. In that case, R will treat that whole column as string data and it will convert it into a factor. Right? So that means something that you expected to be numeric is treated as a string So then, or treated as a factor. Then you have to go and think, oh, why did this happen? Okay? So that's the whole idea. Okay? So that is why this is useful. STR is useful just for you to have a cross check on was everything read in correctly. Now, incidentally, notice that car name has been read in as a factor, right? Which means that there is a slight inconsistency, inconsistency, right? Because when I showed the command to read it, I said strings as factors equals false, right? In fact, if you use the command, it won't be read as a factor. But the result I'm displaying here is a result of not reading it with that particular option, okay? So there is an inconsistency between this and my command itself. So don't get confused by this. Okay, so it's saying by default, read.csv converts character columns to factors. Okay, so that assumes that in this particular command, I have not used that particular option of strings as factors. Okay, now why is uh, exploratory data analysis, why is graphing or visualization important? Okay, so this is a data set that I think you people might be familiar with. It's called Anscombe's Quartet. And uh, Anscombe, the statistician who created four data sets which looked identical from all summary information you could get, right? So the, the four data sets had two columns, X and Y, and all of them had a mean for X of 9, mean for Y of 11, uh, of sorry, mean for Y of 7.5. All of them had variance uh, almost identical, right? So 11, exact, in fact, sample variance of X and sample variance of Y was 4.125 almost exact up to point not not three correlation uh, up to three decimal places was the same and linear regression line up to two and three decimals is exactly the same and the coefficient of determination the r square is exactly the same right so from many uh, angles the four data sets look almost identical because summary information about them look to be very very close closely related and yet when you plot the data you find that they are very different there's one data set, here's another data set, here's a third one which is clearly not linear, it's cur curvilinear, and here's a fourth one in which all the points here are aligned vertically except for one point. Okay, so this is what tells us that just going by numbers may not be enough. You have to take a look at the data. 
So visualization becomes very important. Another illustration, this is just something that I created. Let's say you have three cities and something we are measuring about these three cities. The mean is very close. Uh, means are all very close. The medians are also very close. Okay, And yet when you look at the data, it looks like this. Right? The means are all very close because you can see the center of each of these distributions is somewhere near 10. Right? But if you look at how the date, this one uh, is sort of thin and tall as, as opposed to this, which is comparatively thick and short. And then you have this third one, which is bimodal. Right? You've got a big spike, a spike here and you've got another big spike here. Okay? So the, they're very different in terms of uh, the actual data itself, but they look very similar when you look at only the summary information. Now let us get into actual graph generation. So here we will learn about histograms. The function to generate a histogram is simple, it's just hist. So you can say hist auto dollar acceleration, that is the variable that you want to uh, generate a histogram for. And of course it has to be a vector right or you can say hist auto comma 7 you know from your lab on data frames that uh, you can specify the name of a data frame within square brackets you indicate the rows you want and the columns you want if you leave out something that means all so here we have not specified the row that means I want all the rows and I want only the seventh column which contains acceleration right alternately instead of having to say auto dollar acceleration you can do attach auto and then simply do hist acceleration, right? What attach does is uh, when, if you just type the command hist acceleration, R will say there's no variable called acceleration, right? Because acceleration is inside of uh, auto. It's not a general variable that's available. So R will say, I can't find it. But the moment you say attach auto, then you're telling R, look, when you're looking for variables, also go and look inside this particular data frame. So if you do this, then you get the histogram, okay? So histogram, uh, you're probably familiar with histograms. What it does is, first of all, to generate a histogram, you need numeric data. And what the histogram does is, it creates uh, bins for the numeric data, and then it tells us how many data points fell into each bin, okay? That's what a histogram is telling us. And uh, we only said hist auto dollar acceleration are figured out what bins to use, right? R also figured out uh, what label to put on the x-axis, what label to put on the y-axis, and what name to give to the overall graph. Okay, all of this it did automatically. Of course, we can control everything. So here we say his auto dollar acceleration. Here we are trying to con control the label on the x-axis instead of uh, instead of auto dollar acceleration. We just want it to be acceleration. So we say x-lab is acceleration. And then the main title for the chart, we don't want any title because everybody can see that it is a histogram and uh, what it's a histogram of is indicated in the x-axis. There's no point in giving the graph a title. So I'm saying main is just open quote, close quote, empty string. And then you get this. Okay. Uh, so there's no main title. The x-axis label is acceleration. And y-axis, of course, is showing the frequency. So we want to leave it alone. Okay, uh, so sometimes what we want is we want in the x-axis to show not the frequency but the probability. Okay, so here you can see here we are saying hist auto dollar mpg prob equals true, right? That notice that the y-axis label now changed from frequency to density, right? So it is telling us what proportion of values fall into each range. Okay, it's dividing it back into proportions. Okay, so it's showing us the densities. <clears throat> okay, another important point about base graphics is many of the charts that we generate, what they do is they clear the graphing area and they plot a completely new graph. Okay, so that is what happened when you did hist, for example. If, if you were if you were in an R environment and you established you you gave this hist command, and let's say prior to this you had created another graph, what will happen is it will wipe out the graph and put the histogram on top. Now sometimes what we will want to do is to plot one graph 
and on top of that plot additional things. You do that by using the lines function. So here we're saying lines density auto dollar mpg. Now density is like a histogram except that it's a continuous representation. Okay, so this lines density auto dollar mpg is what created this particular line. Okay, so here uh, if you want the bars to be colored, you can say co color equals blue. And here breaks equals 15 controls how many bars we have. Okay, so earlier remember we had only around 10. I think that's the default. So here we've got more because we said breaks equals 15 and it's blue because we said color equals blue. Okay, uh, so that's, that's what's going on here. Okay, now we can also, usually it might be interesting for us to look at histogram with a normal curve. Okay, now this is not part of the basic R thing. So for this, I have written a function called, uh, which is in this file, dar2ed hist with normal R, right? So before you can use this function, dar2ed.hist.with.normal, this is just the name of the function because it's my function. I gave it a long name so that it shouldn't clash with any other function. Okay. Now, before you can use this function, you have to load this file, which I have given you. And then you have to source the file in. In other words, load the file into a text window in R, code window in R, and then press the source button. Right. Then it will execute the whole file and this function will then become available. So if you do this, then you see that uh, what R is doing is, what the function is doing is plotting the histogram with a gray color and then the histogram data has a certain mean and standard deviation. So what it's then doing is plotting the normal distribution with the same mean and standard deviation. Okay, so if the, if the, if the data was normally distributed, it should have looked something like this, but it's looking slightly different. In other words, the maximum instead of being at the center, is somewhat off to the left, which tells us that this data is somewhat skewed to the right. Okay, uh, here's another example. Okay, and here this looks more normally distributed. Okay, and notice that this, uh, this plot shows the density because obviously it's comparing with the normal distribution, so it has to show the density. Okay. Let's now look at box plots. Box plots are also very important. And as I mentioned earlier, the box plot was invented by Tukey. Okay. And again, you can just do box plot auto dollar MPG. That's enough. Okay. But if you want X lab and color and so on, you can add those things. Okay. So box plot looks like this. And in case uh, you don't recall from earlier courses, a box plot shows you the box in the box plot shows you the data in the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile, first quartile to third quartile. That's what the box is, okay? So you have an idea of where it is distributed with respect to the overall data, okay? So here you can see that even though the range is quite large, much of the data lies in the lower part of the range. That's what you can infer from this, <coughs> okay? The line, of course, shows the median. The line in the box shows the median and uh, the the length from the first quartile to the third quartile is called the interquartile range. So in this case, the interquartile range will be 30 minus, let's say, 16. So it will be about 14 is the interquartile range. And this line falls at third quartile plus 1.5 times the IQR, interquartile range. Okay. So it will be falling at, let's say, the interquartile range I said is about 14. Uh, 1.5 times 14 is about 17.5, so 13, 17.5, roughly 40 something. <coughs> uh, sorry, uh, it should be uh, IQR is 14, so 1.5 times IQR is 21, and therefore the line is falling at around 30 plus 21. Okay, so roughly close to 50. That that's where the line is falling, and this line, uh, the bottom, is falling at. Uh, 1.5 uh, below the uh, IQR, below the 25th percentile, or if the no data is below that level, then it goes to the minimum. Okay, so in this case, it's not 1.5 times uh, 25 percentile minus 1.5. This simply happens to be where the minimum data point fell because no data point went even further below this. Okay, 
So if a point went further below the 1.5 IQR, then it will show the 1.5, otherwise it will show the minimum. So again, if there were no values above the, uh, you know, above 1.5 or above, if the maximum fell within the 1.5 IQR, then the bars here, the lines here and here will represent simply the minimum and the maximum. Okay, here I've just generated a plot to take a look at the histogram and the box plot together. Okay, um, now uh, why might you want to do this? Why? Because both of these are descriptions of how data is distributed. Right? The histogram shows it in one way, the box plot shows it in a different way and looking at both of them together might be useful. Okay, so what you can see here is that, uh, you know, as expected, what we what we saw is what we are seeing here, right? It's just one below the other. Uh, I have written code to generate this plot, you know, top to bottom plot. I'm not going to discuss that code because we are not going. To, it's it's a little complicated, as you can see here. Uh, you can load this code into R and explore it for yourself, but I'm not going to uh, get into the details of this. Okay. Uh, and again, you may want to look at the data in more closely by showing more breaks on the histogram, same data with more breaks. Okay, so clearly you can see why so much of the data is in this 25 to 75% range. You can see from the bars, you can see many of the bars are right there. Okay, it's also interesting that the values below here are more than the values above here. Right, so the density here is also higher than the density here, which you would not see from the box plot. Okay, so uh, again, coming to the guideline that we had about showing comparisons. Okay, so what we are looking at here is instead of just looking at one box plot for the entire data set, how about we compare the box plots for cars with different numbers of cylinders? Okay. So here we are using a specific notation that R uses to represent uh, uh, what are called uh, uh, model expressions in R, right? So the tilde, what the tilde is telling you is whenever you have a tilde, what is on the left hand side is sort of like the, the dependent variable and what is on the right hand side is sort of like independent variables or independent expressions, okay? So we are saying show me the miles per gallon as a function of cylinders. In other words, put miles per gallon on the uh, uh, y-axis and put cylinders on the x-axis, right? Because you're saying y is a function of x, okay? So if you do that, you'll get this plot, okay? So what you're seeing here is that uh, you can see a clear difference between the MPG of cars with different numbers of cylinders, okay? This showing the comparison is useful. Right? Because you're able to see that four-cylinder cars seem to have the maximum MPG and uh, three-cylinder cars not so much, right? So here it increases as you go from three to four, but then it declines uh, steadily, okay? So showing comparisons is useful. You're also seeing that there are more outliers here, right? These dots represent outliers. That means values which are uh, above the uh, fourth quartile, about the third quartile by more than 1.5 of the IQR. So those are outliers, meaning they're far too out of the normal range. So you can clearly see that there are more outliers in the six and eight cylinders than on any of the other cylinders, okay? So there has to be a reason for that and we'll look at that, okay? We'll, in, in a later thing, we'll examine why these things happen, okay? So that's the idea, that comparisons allow you to come to more inferences or allow you to see more into the data. Now one thing we need to be careful here is that all of these box plots are generated based on different numbers of data. So we already know that there were many more four-cylinder cars than three-cylinder cars, okay? In fact, four-cylinder cars were uh, and eight-cylinder cars were the maximum in terms of number, right? So these box plots are based on more data than the other box plots, right? So is there a way we can bring that into the picture? There is, and you do that by doing var width equals true, variable width. That is, make the width of the box plot proportional to the data sets, size of the data sets, right? So this clearly shows us 
that these box plots, these three box plots were based on more data than these two box plots. There were very few three cylinder cars and five cylinder cars. Maximum number of cars, of course, are four cylinder cars, and six and eight are not insignificant. Quite a few six and eight, eight cylinder cars as well. Okay, so the bot box width is proportional to the square root of the sample size, right? If they made it directly proportional to the sample size itself, then you know the the graph would not be helpful. But when they make it proportional to the square root, then the variability reduces and it becomes possible to show the data on the uh, on the chart. Okay, we can do the same for the year of each car. So we can say, are there more cars from here? So we can do box plot MPG with model year, meaning we want to find out if the miles per gallon has changed over the years. Okay, so we say box plot MPG till day model year data equals auto. And you can see, well, uh, generally there is a trend that miles per gallon is increasing over time. Uh, for some reason, it looks like there was a major jump from 79 to 80. Uh, so that's that's a good thing that we can further explore what happened between 79 and 80 that caused this jump Okay, it could be because uh, oil prices were you know oil prices had been increasing right from 70s mid 70s oil prices had increased tremendously and but uh, The government started the US government started putting pressure on car manufacturers to make more and more fuel efficient cars maybe the fact is that those efforts started coming into fruition around uh, the turn of that decade 79 and 80 perhaps it's just a hypothesis speculation that i'm doing but clearly you can see that there was a big jump here also a big jump in 74 i don't know what happened at least in the median there is a jump so what exactly happened i don't know uh, but it's there these are things that uh, plot would help would bring it bring out for us uh, which you would not be able to see just looking at the numbers Okay. So we want to find out are all of these based on the uh, same number of cars or is it that there are more cars in some years and less cars in some years? Well, we know what to do. We can use bar width to find that out. Okay, I've not shown the plot, but you can do that and see what's going on. Okay, uh, scatter plots are used when you want to examine the relationship of two numerical variables to each other, right? So when it came to histograms, we were looking at the distribution of a single numerical variable. When it came, came to box plots, we looked at the distribution of a single variable, but we also looked at the relationship between a single numeric variable with a single categorical variable, right? So for example, you had number of cylinders, which was categorical. We plotted that against the MPG, which was numerical. The first box plot was just box plot of MPG, just a single numerical variable, okay? Histogram single numerical variables. Now we want to look at how would you study the relationship of two numeric variables to each other? To do that, you do scatter plot. Okay, so plot is the function, general function we use, and plot is used to produce scatter plots, and you indicate which variables you want. Clearly, you're saying, I want MPG on the y-axis, horsepower on the x-axis, right? MPG tilde horsepower. And this is what you get. Okay, so this is just the default. You want the points to be filled. All of that is under our control, but I won't get into it. Okay. Uh, so here you can see, uh, this is the scatter plot. Clearly you can see, of course, as we expect, that as the horsepower increases, miles per gallon goes down, right? So that's why you've got a trend like this. Uh, you can draw a linear, uh, a line to recapture this relationship, but it really looks like this is a quadratic relationship, right? There's a curve which will be a better indicator of this. Okay, so that's how you get a scatter plot here. If you want to add a regression line to the linear regression line to the scatter plot, you can do this plot. And then we are saying, generate the linear regression model of this relationship. Okay, uh, I'm sure you have looked at linear regression already. Uh, and later in our course also, we'll be looking at linear regression. So what we are doing is finding out a straight line that goes through the points uh, and is a best fit for those points, right? So we got the straight line, uh, but of course we haven't plotted the line yet. We plot the line, of course, by using the function AB line mod, okay? AB line is another function that is used to plot lines, right? So lines is a generic function to add something on top of some of an existing plot. 
AB line, it, it uses uh, a different format and mod already contains the data in that format. So if you do that, you then get uh, not only the points, but you also get the regression line. Okay. So clearly, of course, this is not, a straight line is not the best fit for this. The best fit for this would be a curve. Okay. Now, often we want to find, uh, you know, for example, our data set contains nine columns. So you may have a data set that has many columns and you want to look at the scatter plot of two variables at a time for many of the variables rather than generating all the two by twos uh, manually. Okay, so scatter plot matrix is a good way to do that. Scatter plot matrix is created by the function pairs. Okay, and here we are saying on the left hand side we don't put anything, we put tilde and then just indicate all the variables we want to plot. Okay, uh, so because here we are not plotting x against y. Okay, so we are saying take all these variables, show me the scatter plot of all the combinations of these variables taking two at a time. And the result is this. Okay, so what you can see here is for every plot, you can figure out what is on the x axis and what is on the y axis by looking at which title is parallel. So, for example, this plot has MPG parallel to the x axis and displacement parallel to the y axis. So, clearly, this is a plot of uh, MPG on the x axis, displacement on the y axis. This is the reverse plot, right? MPG on the y axis and displacement on the x axis. Okay, it's basically the same plots, but the points are all uh, transposed. Okay, so here you see a plot of displacement, displacement versus horsepower, horsepower on the x-axis, displacement on the y-axis, and so on. Okay, or displacement versus weight. Okay, so you can see that uh, you can explore quite a few things here uh, in one go, right? When you have several numeric variables and you want to explore the connections between all of them taken pairwise, then scatter plot matrix is a very useful plot, right? So it tells us clearly that horsepower and displacement have a very linear sort of a relationship, right? Displacement seems to have a fairly linear relationship with weight as well, okay? But the other relationships seems to, uh, they generally seem to be quadratic using this kind of one, okay? So again, what we have done is, uh, we have achieved what the very first slide talked about as data visualization, right? We have given a complex data set. You want to uh, make the data set more understandable in the form of pictures. And we have shown how to do that with several examples.